Welcome back to Absences. Today we're joined by special guest Eric Wargo. Eric Wargo is the author of Time Loops, Precognition, Retrocausation, and the Unconscious, and the forthcoming book, Precognitive Dreamwork and the Long Self. His PhD in Anthropology from Emory University. He joins us today to have a discussion on Alien and also cover some of his work on the nature of time, precognition, and Einstein Minkowski spacetime. Thank you to Eric Wargo for coming on Absence's podcast today. We really appreciate it, Eric. Uh, good to have you. Yeah, oh, it's great to be here. Looking forward to it. I'm here with uh, Charlie, my co-host as well. Um, so, Eric, we're going to kind of start out by asking you questions about your uh, essay, The Passion of the Space Shockey. Um, this is concluding kind of a three-part segment we've been doing on the film Alien, and uh, just the philosophical and psychoanalytic uh, mythological dimensions of that film, and how that kind of plays into modern-day technology and uh, what we see going on in the world today, trajectories, and so forth. But before we kind of dive into all that, I just want to ask you, you know, to biographical note, what drew you to the film in the first place? What drew you to write the essay that you did? And how does this, if at all, uh, tie into the research you've been doing in the paranormal and aberrant notions of time? <laughs> okay. Well, the first part of that is easy to answer. I Alien was a, a really, really important film for me growing up. I mean, I, you know, I, I was the generation that saw Star Wars in the theater, you know, age 10. It was perfect. You know, I, obviously that was huge for my, for my development as a, as a boy. <laughs> um, but uh, Alien came out two years after that, and it really captured my imagination in a in a very different way. Um, and it has always stuck with me. You know, I've, I've you know I don't think a, a year has gone by in my life when I when I have not watched Alien at least once <laughs> during that year. You know, and uh, and I've thought about it a lot, and it in grad school in the early 90s i got very into i read a lot of critical theory got into lacan slavoj zizek was like just had just burst on the scene and and actually zizek does not say that much about alien he sort of you know touches on it here and there but it's like it's obvious if you <laughs> if you are you know gripped by lacanian thinking um the you know alien is just it's all there you know all of lacan is somehow in that, in that movie and and uh so that intellectual critical dimension then you know has has fueled you know much further thinking about the film over the years and i so that's the you know, that, that's a short answer as to why I'm interested in the film. And I've, you know, I've written a lot about it on my blog um, here and there. Uh, but then I, two, uh, three years ago, um, I was invited to a conference on Gnosticism, sort of Gnosticism in a sort of a modern American context. And I thought, wow, this is the perfect opportunity to talk about the Gnostic dimensions of, uh, that I see in, in, uh, in alien, uh, which I is not a, a subject that ha I had, that I was aware had been written about by other critics. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not up on all the critical writing on, on alien, but, uh, I've always seen a Gnostic subtext in the film. Um, and particularly in Giger's contribution to the film and particularly the space jockey. And so it was the perfect opportunity to, to uh, get my ideas down uh, about that. Um, and so I, and that's, that was the basis then for the article that appeared in the, in the journal Gnosis last year um, called the passion of the space jockey. Yeah. To me, uh, to me, the space jockey is like, as uh, it's almost a spiritual or religious symbol for me. Uh, I, I think it, it's, you know, it's right up there. You know, it's like, if you, if you want to talk about the sort of the, the, the painful interpenetration of spirit and matter, I mean, well, that's what the crucifixion, that's what a crucifix is, right? I mean, that's, you know, if that, that's the classic religious symbol that's, you know, spirit 
pinned literally, you know, nailed to matter, you know, they're like the painful joining of these two, you know, this, this duality of, of, of the human, you know, uh, well, the space jockey is another way of showing that, uh, that sort of painful union of spirit and matter, but in a very different way and a very Gnostic way. I mean, it's, it's an Ouroboros, right? I mean, the, the space jockey is a, an Ouroboric figure. It's a, you know, it was a, a sent, clearly a sentient being inseparable from the machine that it piloted, you know, it's just so much going on with this, you know, amazing inspired uh, creation that, that really came entirely from, from Giger. I mean, it was his contribution to that film. This was not in the script that the, that the star pilot was going to be, you know, to have grown out of the ship somehow, <laughs> you know, uh, that's, you know, this is, and it's all in, it's throughout Giger's art. I mean, this is a, a common motif in Giger's paintings from the 1970s uh, was, you know, sort of sentient beings are sort of growing out of the walls of a, uh, of this kind of kind of hellish interiors and you know are sort of suffering and he brought that he you know it was totally him that brought that to to alien so yeah the, the my article passion of the space jockey sort of reflects on these themes and how where they fit into the history of science fiction i mean it's part of a tradition sort of 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 living ships and pilots that are sort of you know merged to their ships as a kind of prosthetic almost um but I, giggers is the most interesting now they asked to your last question how does it fit into my other work it doesn't i mean it's really kind of it's tangential i mean it's it's uh well I, i'm that that's i mean glib i think it it does fit in some ways, but it's, uh, it was kind of a breath of fresh air to write about this other sci-fi topic that doesn't necessarily bear on my writing about precognition and retrocausation, but I, it, it kind of could, I mean, I think you could see hints of it in, in the article, but I didn't sort of elaborate on them. Okay, cool. So it's really interesting that you wrote this about the space jockey because we also, Charlie and I had a lot of ideas for the second part of our series. And we wanted to touch on the space jockey. Um, one of the main reasons we didn't is just because we couldn't quite figure out what exactly we were looking at. It's not, not just because of the, like the morphological features. I mean, just the structure of the thing is incredibly, obviously alien, but also there's, there were so many mythological dimensions that were going on that I couldn't quite wrap my head around it. I mean, you mentioned the Ouroboros, you've mentioned the crucifixion. Um, I think these are really, really interesting topics, but one of the most important things that you bring up um, in Passion of the Space Jockey is how the space jockey kind of reiterates, let's say, a uh, unicellular past, you say. Um, so I'll quote you real quick here. Uh, Giger's work presciently showed us aspects of our distant unicellular past that may well be recapitulated in our biotechnological future. I think this is really interesting because in, like, in contrast to the collective unconscious or like a literalistic reading of Freudian birth trauma, um, there's a sort of biological unconscious at work here. And it seems that Giger's work occupies this sort of like liminal space. And the space jockey as well op occupies this liminal space. It's often paradoxical in Giger's work. There's this mixing of the organic and the inorganic, human and the inhuman, and it sort of forces us into contact with this deep past. And crucially for me, um, this is where I'm kind of seeing the tie between this work and your other work, uh, a deep past and also a distant future. And what I what I kind of mean by that is there's the space jockey is almost like an atemporal knot that the the crew of the nostromo whenever they descend down into like the underworld of lv246 or a 426 excuse me lv426 there's this encounter with something that is almost eschatological in nature like it's a vision of what was what is and what is to come almost something has happened in the deep past there's something happening right now that's about to change the course of their entire lives and uh take a lot of them. But yes, yeah, so I want to kind of get a, a feel for the Gnostic, maybe the eschatological dimension, if you see any at play here um, within this within this symbol. I mean, how, how deep does that Gnosticism and that religiosity kind of run, do you think? Maybe explain a little bit more about the Ouroboric nature. 
Well, to go back to that, the, the, this theme in a lot of Giger's art, which the space jockey is like the ultimate exemplar of, but it's throughout all of his paintings really from the 1970s, not all of them, but, but a lot of them. This idea of, of this sentient suffering being that's imprisoned, but not just imprisoned, but is like physically inseparable from this material matrix. Okay. Um, a lot of his paintings, a lot of his most characteristic art from that period, you know, almost it shows these kind of these kind of dark canyons. I, I that's oh, I think of them as canyons somehow. And then and from the walls of the canyons are these these kind of uh, erotic or clownish or demonic figures that are like you know that they're, they're they're maybe missing some of their limbs or whatever, and they're kind of sprouting from these walls. You know, these dark walls so this idea of sentience that is like inseparable from this machine matrix is really what, what i what i've always i've always seen that ever since i first read about gnosticism you know i don't know 20 years ago or whatever you know there's that phrase that periodically comes up in gnostic texts you know the fall of spirit into matter all right there's this uh this kind of original yeah, this, the, predicament, the predicament of humans is that we've, we're spiritual beings who have somehow fallen into this 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 material world, and and of course there were a lot of different Gnostic sects with different views on that uh, and how to you know whether to you know rebel against the physical body completely or to embrace it or or whatever. But that's you know that's sort of the basic Gnostic kind of predicament. All right, and so I, I see. Giger's work is expressing the fall of spirit into matter. Now, what the other thing, the other sort of touchstone that that I talk about in in this article and that that's kind of always been in the back of my mind uh, in thinking about the space jockey is the the writing and the the thinking of of the biologist Lynn Margulis, who was a, a pioneer of and thinking about the early evolution of life on earth and she was the one who who really advanced the idea i don't think she was the first to come up with it but i think she really kind of advanced this idea uh that she called endosymbiosis which is that 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 the first complex cells uh eukaryotes were the product of, of a merger, of a merger of multiple simpler organisms that started to grow together. And this idea, which sounds kind of science fictional and weird, has been, you know, borne out. I mean, it's that it's all it's accepted, you know, very accepted science now that that, yeah, in fact, you know, cells, all the, the organelles in cells were originally, they're descended from what were originally independent organisms, you know, in the primordial soup that that, that just sort of formed these mergers that, that were productive for the, for the collective. And so, uh, and some of the, some organelles and cells like the mitochondria, you know, famously have the, their own DNA still that, 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 you know, sh proves that these were, these were originally independent organisms that, that, ha that have grown together. And what I see in the space jockey mm -hmm. is like this, this future trajectory of sentient organic creatures that have, you know, merged with their technology. So it's a kind of endosymbiosis, which, to get to what you were saying, it's like a far future kind of reflection of something that happened, you know, in the distant, in our distant, you know, unicellular past. Uh, and so it's a, it's a kind of scientific take uh, or evolutionary take on, on this Gnostic idea of fall of spirit into matter. I mean, what if we as spiritual beings, you know, are become imprisoned, fall into our, technology in some way are we already on that trajectory and um the you know the, the and here again this you look at just what the space the space jockey again 
uh, you know, what is he doing? He's sitting there in a seat. No one knows exactly what this machine is. And you can sort of see it as a cannon. You can see it as a telescope. Uh, you can see it as, you know, it's some, some, some control system. Uh, but he's staring into what must be some kind of screen, you know, with his hands on the controls somehow. Well, you know, just think think of the way we, you know, we we wander the world, you know, staring into screens. You know, we we're increasingly we are, you know, imprisoned in our seats. Essentially, you know, it's like I often imagine that, like, you know, after a, after, you know, an eight hour day of you know sitting at my computer, you know, at work. Uh, or writing or whatever. It's like you feel like you're kind of growing out of your seat, you know, and, and I'm just I'm just this being that's essentially this Ouroboros creature, you know, I I'm, I'm, might as well be physically part of my seat, you know, staring at a, at a computer screen. And what, what does that do to us? And, and, and the fact that, that the space jockey in some, you know, distant past died you know staring into his screen you know as you know the, the xenomorph burst out of his chest uh, you know that's you know, people people get killed all the time you know getting hit by cars staring at their cell phones you know it's like there's a we are on that trajectory and you know another and of course the other sort of the other touchstone actually in the in the article is the work of donna haraway who is who has theorized the cyborg, you know, the sort of uh, hybrid of not only not hybrids, but but the interdependency, the, the in, intricate or the inextricable dependency of of us uh, on on technology. You know, technology goes all the way down. I mean, we we would be, you know, we can't survive without technology. Where that's part of who we are as a species, and uh, but it's but as technology advances and and uh and it becomes more uh just sort of natural for us to have kind of technological prosthetics of various kinds um that uh give us these new freedoms but also take certain freedoms away and it's you know so that's somehow that all all this all of these philosophical topics and conversations you know are all embedded in this one image, and Giger, of course, was not consciously thinking in, in any of these terms. I mean, he was he was influenced by the science fiction tradition. He was influenced by H. P. Lovecraft uh, very explicitly, but other than that, I mean, he's not. He, he, it's all it's all bubbling from his unconscious. Um, but it's it's it just feels very prophetic uh, what he was what he was right. um, what he was seeing. And like a lot of, and uh, and this is something I say at the end of my article, I mean, like a lot of Gnostic prophecies, it was his vision was too difficult for people and they erased it. You know, when, when Ridley Scott returned to the alien universe to make Prometheus, you know, the, he forgot what he once knew, which was that in fact, this is a creature that's grown out of its seat, uh, and the the script writer just didn't know how to tell a story about about such beings, and was was not up to the task. I mean, he sort of had a failure of imagination. It's like he couldn't, you know, he didn't want to deal with that, so he he, he copped out in a huge way, you know, making the engineers, you know, just big pale white humans you know and it's it's all just a a big suit you know it's just like just ridiculous uh kind of but you know that reminds me of the way gnostic texts have been suppressed <laughs> you know and and it's a it's it was the suppression of a, a real powerful gnostic prophecy i think yeah i was going to say that uh, i think that this film it, it's it's almost like properly Heideggerian in a sense um, that I think it's attempting to at least unconsciously kind of um, get at what the essence of technology actually is. I think I want to save that for a little bit later. Uh, Charlie, do you have anything you want to bring up right now? Yeah, I was just going to jump in actually. Um, before we leave the subject of the the space jockey, I've always seen the figure as passive in his or her fate in the same way that perhaps. Uh, like you're saying, where people are looking at their cell phones all the time and not realizing they're in danger, but they're kind of passively doing so. And another 
thing I always think of is the idea of, you know, the cordyceps fungus and ants that kind of take it over and erase its will for, for lack of a better description. In the sense of prophecy, like you're saying, kind of the tech to come, the future, how does that, I mean, perhaps this is a question that can kind of lead into more of your other work, but how do we find meaning in that? Are, are we to become passive in our acceptance of this integrative nature of technology in our lives? Or are we going to find meaning through revolting against it? Um, is that a retrocausal type of approach to this situation? Or what do you think on that? Well, I see it as a warning. And I think Giger saw it as a warning. And he explicitly, you know, said that the future could be like, like my paintings, you know. And I think he's I, that I think that's a real concern. And I, 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 so I know I, we should not be passive about, uh, about this. And we're right to resist these tendencies to become so passively, I won't say dependent on our technologies. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's okay to be dependent on our technologies, but it's, it's so passive about what they're doing to us, I guess, about, about what we're giving up uh, in terms of our autonomy. So I, yeah, I, I don't, I use I'm using the word prophecy more more in the kind of more general sense. I don't I don't know I don't I don't think Giger was precognizing you know some future you know I think he was he was in the sense of a biblical prophet. Okay, he was saying you know this is you know here's here's a vision from my unconscious of where the human hum, human race is going where I see it going and and do with it what you will you know. Uh, but I think we should, we should take that warning seriously. It's a very, it's a very interesting warning and it's, and it's different, you know, there, okay. There are a lot of, in science fiction, there are a lot of, um, I mean, the idea of people enslaved by their machines or whatever is, is, it's a very common idea, right? But usually the way it works is that the mind is somehow erased you know, and where our physical bodies become the tool, you know, or become what, you know, we, we become slaves, just sort of, yeah, I mean, it's just an image of slaves, essentially. But what what's unique in, in the space jockey and in Giger, um, more generally, but let's just talk about space jockey. What's unique there is that this is a the opposite in a way. It's like the, it's like this, the sentience of this being has been co-opted by a machine uh, like this. You can almost, you, you try to sort of imagine the life world or the, the civilization of these space jockeys, you know, and um, there are a lot of different ways to imagine it, but, and, and it could be that the space jockey is a very specialized role, you know, and, and that, you know, it's not like, you know, if you went to their home planet, they would all be like that. And he may be kind of drone or whatever, who knows, but, the the idea that that it, what's needed by the machine is his mind, okay, his spirit. Here I'm here working back to this idea of spirit fallen into matter. You know, it's his spirit that is that is being used, and his and his his independent living is has been taken away because the machine needs his spirit. So it's sort of um, that's that's the interesting reversal and yet that's that's a unique idea uh, uh i think i mean i don't know i'm maybe maybe other science fiction writers have, have had a similar vision but I, I it feels very very unique and strange and but there's something really compelling about it i mean i i there's a reason that the space that scene you know i don't think it's just me we like the the scene when you first the camera pulls back and you see the space jockey there, this giant, you know, fossilized star pilot. I mean, that is a powerful, powerful scene in cinema. You know, that's a, it's, it's, it's the most haunting scene in that movie. And the, the movie is, is, is haunting and scary and, and, and thought provoking in all kinds of ways. But that I, I think is the most powerful scene. Uh, and, and I don't think I'm the only one who, <laughs> you know, that that's what, is is haunting about that movie and it's in fact there was that scene that had always haunted ridley scott and made him want ultimately to return to the alien universe and make uh prometheus i mean he wanted to answer the question who is that creature you know uh and unfortunately in his 
I don't know, older age and maybe kind of, you know, farming it off to some young scriptwriter, you know, he, he, he let other people answer that question and, it, you know, in a very inadequate way, but it was, you know, it's that scene that is so haunting. So I think, I think there's, uh, there's a reason to be fixated on, on on the space jockey. You know, this isn't just some just some alien nerd <laughs> issue, right? And I mean, the term that you use, term you use in uh, Passion of the Space Jockey, and it comes up again in uh, Time Loops as well, is the notion of jouissance. So Lacan's concept, basically, for anybody who doesn't know, it's a kind of sick delectation or like a perverse sort of. Uh, what, what's the, what's the, how's the way that you, how do you phrase well, it? In the paper? There, the, I, what I love about the, what I love about the term is it kind of has a lot of, you can, you can read it in a lot of different ways. And I like, I like that, that there are different ways to, to understand the term that I, I sort of describe it as pleasurable pain or painful pleasure. Okay. Ultimately it can be kind of a, a very unpleasurable drive. It's something you do, even though, you know, you don't, necessarily want to uh so that in that sense it can cover kind of notions of addiction uh, sort of addictive behavior you know very neurotic behavior but um uh, but I, I i i tend to use it in my work uh to 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 as a stand in for the idea of extreme extreme emotion of, of whatever kind that's that has a dimension of unpleasure along with pleasure a kind of a mix of those. So I, I sort of use it as a catch-all for any kind of emotional experience that has a dual valence, okay, positive and negative at the same time. You can't kind of separate those. And yeah, it's it's I, I think it's it's kind of key to the the phenomenon of, of precognition that, that I've I've written a couple books about now. Um, so you mentioned uh, you mentioned precognition there um, and its role with jouissance. Um, I want to come back to jouissance again a little bit later, uh, but could you kind of just define for everybody uh, who may not be familiar with the work what exactly is precognition? What's retrocausation and uh, maybe you know, general overview of the relationship to the unconscious? Um, and what drove you to drove you to write that book? Um, yeah, what drove me to write that book? Yeah, I uh, well for various reasons that I've gone into detail about on other podcasts. I, won't, I don't want to waste time here talking about them. I, I got very interested in ESP about a decade ago. And, uh, well, I'll say I, I had a couple of, of UFO, minor UFO encounters or UFO sightings that prompted me to, to, to uh, delve into the, the subject. I'd never really read much about ufology and uh in reading about ufology you know the, the, some of the leader leading lights in that field uh don't separate the phenomenon of ufos from psychic phenomena because they go to they go to hand in hand in in many ufo encounters and experiences like jacques Vallée. jacques Vallée, yeah that's the that's the main uh figure who 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 sort of originally sort of wedded these these topics um because again and again in this in the experiences and uh, encounters that he was writing about again and again psychic phenomena went hand in hand with the the encounter with a physical object of whatever sort and i had as a scientifically educated uh modern person i had problems with esp you know, it just didn't fit into my my worldview. UFO is fine. You know, you can have a, a perfectly materialistic understanding of, of UFOs, and that doesn't didn't challenge any of my beliefs. But psychic phenomena did, and so I, it sort of inspired a whole going down a very deep rabbit hole of parapsychology and to understand well, what's you know, what's you know, is this is this a real topic and uh, in the process, I discovered that, in fact, it is. And there is, in fact, abundant evidence for especially precognition uh, phenomenon, uh, which is apparently seeing events in the future or getting glimpses of future experiences, for instance, in dreams and so on. And 
as I was delving into this, the evidence, I was also taking a new, fresh look at my own experiences over the course of my life in dreams, for instance. I'd kept a dream journal for decades, and uh, I'd, I'd had dreams that were precognitive, but I had just kind of swept it under the rug. I didn't, you know, it's like, uh, there's a there's a weird way in which paranormal phenomena of whatever sort, um, when we don't have a framework to think about them, they just vanish from our memory. And I, fortunately, I had written these things down, so I could go back to them and and examine them. Unfortunately, most people don't write their dreams down, so unfortunately, these things are just kind of gone when they, after a while. But uh, anyway, so I I was it. I was forced to reassess my own experiences and realize, oh, this is a real thing. And and when you start to study it in your own life and start to talk to other people um, who are open to discussing their experiences, it's, it's like, uh, yeah, it's a it's a real it's a it's a real thing. It's a real dimension of of human cognition that is just totally um, ignored. It's totally denied by by uh, mainstream psychology. I, well, I guess one of the one of the things that drove it sort of drove me to this topic was that I was at the time uh, editorial director for a, a major uh, organization of scientific psychologists, and and while I was working there, uh, in a major study of precognition by a big name psychologist was being published in a major journal in the field. And it just enraged people in psychology. I'm not a psychologist by training, but I was, uh, all my colleagues were just, you know, incensed that this was happening because they, psychologists become apoplectic at, at anything smacking of ESP or whatever. Uh, and it, that, that drove me kind of into this rabbit hole of finding out well what's the what's going on here you know and what what are they not wanting to face you know what's the basis of their resistance um you know is it well founded and so on so that was sort of the the roots of of my research into into precognition now what what is I, I, the other term i off, i use is retrocausation. Retrocausation is sort of the physical principle that would allow something like precognition to to occur. That is to say, any kind of physical principle or law that allows an event to influence prior events. That is to say, for a an effect to precede its cause, in some sense. And there is, it turns out, there's growing uh, evidence in physics for this. That that uh, that that uh, there's sort of a minor minor but growing perspective in quantum physics that uh, that some of what some or all of what for the past century has been called randomness in quantum physics the kind of belief that matter is is fundamentally random it that may reflect retro causation that is to say causation acting back from the future toward the past. And interestingly, just in the last few years in the field of quantum computing, researchers are showing that you can, in fact, reverse the causal order in a computation in a quantum computer, which lends support to this idea that there is a, that that information can, can flow from future to past in certain kinds of quantum systems. And at the same time, there's a whole emerging field called quantum biology, which uh, is is looking at these quantum, uh, spooky quantum principles that seem to be operative in biological systems, such as neurons. You know, so there's a whole you can so so my book Time Loops is sort of drawing out these multiple lines of evidence converging on the idea that the brain really may be uh, what I call a tesseract, a kind of four dimensional information processor that is able to uh, draw on information from the individual's future. It's a you know it's a fascinating new kind of paradigm that I'm that that I'm kind of, prophesying is going to be really important 
in the next few decades, possibly. And it presupposes block theory, is that right? The block universe, yeah, uh, which is not at all radical. Um, it's been pretty pretty well accepted since the time of Einstein that, that time is a dimension like space. Pretty much all of relativity theory demands this that you know that's what gravity is is is, is simply the, the the curvature of space into the time dimension and so most physicists have no problem with this idea that in some sense you know past present future are kind of they're kind of cognitive illusions that that it all kind of coexists in this one is this kind of big space-time continuum or space-time block yeah so I, I mean, there's there's one thing about the block universe that always kind of gives me pause, and I know that it gives a lot of physicists pause as well. So I know that block theory is coming under a lot of fire, um, at least by at, at least by a few prominent physicists uh, that I've seen uh, in the past few years, um, and a lot of it has to do with the second law of thermodynamics um, because it seems to be a real system or a re, uh, excuse me a real property of systems although there is also the view that perhaps it's not a real thing at all it's more a description of states um, but I, I wonder in the block theory and in your theory generally how does entropy how does the second law fit into a four-dimensional space-time block theory that seems to be uh, concomitant with eternalism the philosophical view well, the entropy or the second law of thermodynamics is often kind of equated to the experience of time, uh, or it's regarded as sort of the explanation for why we experience time only going in a single direction, even if time itself as a dimension has no directionality any more than space has a directionality. Uh, so the second law of thermodynamics sort of seems to say that, that that systems only become more disordered and thus that information is always kind of, I guess, lost um, as heat, you know, in a, in a, in a system. So that I have no problem with that. The, there are different ways of describing and explaining it. Uh, and one that I find very compelling is it comes from a uh, quantum computing pioneer, and I'm blanking on his name right now. But he describes entropy as essentially just increasing entanglement um, or increasing correlations uh, among particles in in a system or in the universe as a whole. Uh, so it's the sort of the tendency of things to kind of average out or uh, particles to become more entangled with each other and to, in a wider sort of array of entanglements. But when you, this is the great thing about a quantum computer. A quantum computer is, uh, is when you take a bunch of particles and confine them so they have no, no interaction with the, with the surrounding world and you entangle them together. And what you're able to do with that matrix of entangled particles, as long as they, they don't, Interf they're not in interfered with by anything. They can essentially, as I was saying earlier, they can they can perform calculations that go in all direct. There's no temporal order in that special confined system. Okay, when you have a coherent or in highly entangled system, there seems to be kind of eternity there. That's one way of describing it. I mean, a physicist would probably balk at, at that, but but just a simple way of describing it is there's a kind of no natural temporal order or logic to a to a, a quantum computer. Uh, now, the thing is, there are natural quantum computers we now know. I mean, that this is uh, quantum computer. Uh, quantum computing is the basis essentially for photosynthesis, for instance. This was the first biological system that was found to be dependent on uh, quantum processes. A lot of people think that we're only going to discover many, many more such processes at, at, at the root of biological systems. And one of the candidates for, you know, there's a sort of gold rush to cert, to find the basis for consciousness in the brain. And uh, it's been very attractive to, to look at these 
things called microtubules, which are a, an organelle in neurons that seem to have quantum properties and that some people such as Stuart Hameroff think may be quantum computers. Well, if they're quantum computers and they play a role in reshaping the, the cell, the neuron, uh, for instance, forming new synapses and so forth. If, you know, the neuron is full of little quantum computers that are somehow getting information from their own future, then you have the basis for the phenomena that, that I'm talking about in time loops. Um, the, 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 the ability of an organism to be influenced by things that happen ahead in its timeline. Even if it's a very weak effect, it would be decisive, you know, right? Evolutionarily speaking, to have such a thing. And, uh, and, and if it's possible at all, you know, life will find a way. I mean, that's, you know, if, if this is, if it's possible to, to gain information about the future, a living system will do it one way or another, you know? So it seems very reasonable, a reasonable hypothesis that, that something like that is going on um, to account for uh, the almost, the, the, the very prevalent phenomenon of things like precognitive dreams and other types of presentiment or future feeling uh, that are re reported in laboratory experiments and very widespread in human life. Well, going off what you just said, um, would it be fair to attempt the argument to say that consciousness is atemporal, um, especially with your, your idea of the brain as a tesseract or possibly a receptor? Um, would that would that be a fair argument to look at? Yeah, maybe. I'm I'm reluctant to use the term consciousness because there's so much baggage with that term, and it feels like no two people necessarily mean the same thing by it. Um, I'm so I, I'm kind of excited that in the search for consciousness, people are going to kind of hit on some real processes that that see, that will that will explain precognition without uh, making any strong claims about what consciousness per se is i do think that what we call consciousness whatever it is is yeah i guess so yeah i yes it's an atemporal phenomenon in that in that it includes both our future and our past self in my new book that's coming out in a month. Uh, I call it the long self. I, I think that we, uh, that our, our, who we are is, and who we are moment to moment is really a product, not only of who we were and our memory and our experience pushing forward from the past, but also who we will be and events and experiences that lie ahead in our timeline that we don't really know about consciously yet but they're part of our unconscious. In fact, my argument in Time Loops and my argument in the new book is that what Freud identified and called the unconscious is really our future experiences acting, you know, acting back on our present behavior and manifesting in dreams and symptoms, neurotic symptoms, and, and so on. I'm really more interested, honestly, in the unconscious. Uh, that is part was one of my beefs with the with with the emphasis right now on the term consciousness. Uh, everyone talks about consciousness, but the unconscious is really where it's at, and that's where the phenomena I study occur. I mean, there these are all unconscious uh, or manifestations of the unconscious in that in that psychoanalytic sense, right. Something really interesting about that. So first off, in your book, you essentially equate information and causation. So I, I want to kind of, uh, you know, get everybody kind of on the same page for that, because I think it's a really interesting concept. And I think it's hard for everybody to, you know, it's hard for me to wrap my head around the fact that information and causation are the same thing, um, especially when you add in this dimension of, you know, uh, nonlinear temporality, so to speak. So can you kind of just lay out for us how is it that information is causation and how if you if you have a sort of model for how it is that information can turn itself into like say images that can be uh transferred 
back through time that can actually give some sort of precognitive uh, sense of what is about to happen in the future. Well, the, yeah, this idea of in causation and information being kind of the same thing. I'm, I'm the, the sort of information revolution in physics that, that a lot of people associate with John Wheeler. You know, he's, he's the one who's coined the term it from bit. And then let that, that, uh, that revolution of kind of rethinking the physical universe as information. I think a lot of people misunderstand what that meant information does not need to be meaningful okay but but kind of lay people tended to hear hear this as a statement oh the universe is intrinsically meaningful somehow they said tended to link it to you know kind of jungian notions of uh collective unconscious or whatever uh the idea that they the that that information is meaningful but that's not what physicists mean by information they simply mean that you can take you know any causal interact you know when you when you narrow down what, what is causation well at, at the most fine-grained level causation is a particle hitting another particle and causing some property of that particle to change okay in some measurable way all right well when you start to describe those particles as bundles of information you know a particle has you know it has position momentum you know it may it, it'll have a it may have a charge it may have spin in you know three different dimensions or whatever it has these these measurable properties and each interaction changes those properties of those particles well describing causation as information enabled it was sort of a it was really just a, a change in idiom, all right, that that enabled people to start thinking of causal interactions as co computation. Okay, that's what computation is, is when you change the, the measurable properties of a particle. You know, that's that's what a quantum computer is, is you're, you're changing, uh, or, or any computer, it's like you're changing bits or flipping bits, you know, from zero to one. Well, all of those properties of a particle can be flipped or changed, and that's what happens in an interaction. So just, just describing, so the, 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 the information revolution is really just a new way of describing causation as information, which enables us to then think in terms of the universe as computation and enables us to build quantum computers, you know, and enables us to turn, you know, Potentially, you can you can turn any lump of matter. You could turn this this glass of water into a computer uh, as long as you know all the information uh, of all the, the water molecules, you know. And then you do something to this you know glass of water, such as take a sip from it, you know. That's changing all the information in there, and you're essentially performing a computation. You could theoretically program this glass of water and get a get a result you know or you could you could make it perform a, a computation for you anyway so this 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 information revolution really just enabled people to rethink the physical universe in a new in a new way and and to to create all the technologies that have revolutionized uh, our lives over the last few decades, five decades or so, four, four or five decades, you know, um, quantum computers, GPS, you know, iPhones, all that. I mean, this is kind of the product of that information revolution. But again, that doesn't mean information is, it, it doesn't have to be meaningful. What I think a lot of people get confused by is the notion that information somehow means meaningful information, which it doesn't. I mean, most information is just noise. Um, it's only meaningful to the system that's measuring it and needs that result to do something else, you know? So that's what, that's what I, that's what I try to explain in, in time loops that, that, you know, this, this revolution enabled all these technological advances and enable us to then think about how, um, how some of that information that is held by a particle might in fact propagate backward in the time dimension. Um, it may be that some of the information dictating, for instance, where a particle goes after it hits, you know, if it bounces off, you know, particle over here, it goes, you know, you don't know 
we don't know. You, you can't predict in quantum physics exactly what direction it's going to head. You know, that's the randomness element. Well, you know, is it that God plays dice? You know, the, the, the Niels Bohr idea that randomness is just intrinsic to matter? Or as Einstein intuited, there's something else going on, you know, and we just don't know what it is. Well, again, there's a growing kind of minority of, of physicists who are saying, let's, let's take a new look at the idea of retrocausation, uh, that, that it really, some of that information that it, that a particle holds may, you know, it may be retro propagating rather than forward. And that may explain these hitherto random seeming aspects of, of particles behavior. Right, right. That's really interesting. So there's one thing, Charlie set me up for a question that I really want to ask you. But before I do that, following off the information, does the no communication theorem, does that uh, hinder your theory at all? The no communication uh, theorem or the no signaling principle? Um, the fact that in an entangled quantum state, it's not possible for uh, one observer to measure a subsystem and communicate information to another observer, like within these two entangled particles? Or is it somehow that perhaps quantum entanglement is, an, is itself a uh, retroactive or retrocausal uh, system? Would that solve the no communication theorem? Yeah, they would. That's the idea, that, that, that entanglement is not spooky action at a distance. It's not some invisible connection you know, across space between two particles, that their histories are entangled or are, are connected. And, and that's some, you know, a measurement you perform on particle A sends information back to the point at which it, it was entangled with B. And thus, when you measure B, you're going to get a predictable result because of that retrograde uh, connection. And the original person who theorized this is Olivier Costa de Beauregard back in a long time ago, I think 40s or 50s even, um, but it's been resurrected more recently by a, a, a younger generation of physicists uh, who are sort of taking that idea seriously. So yeah, it, retro, retro causation gets around some of these supposed problems. Yeah, that's that's really really fascinating. I really wanted to ask you that. So, um, Eric, how familiar are you with Immanuel Kant? Not super familiar. No, I mean, I think I was at one point because 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 Zizek, you know, <laughs> writes a lot about him. And uh, but I I'm not a philosopher by training, so the big names in philosophy I I I I know just kind of rudimentary. Okay, so. The reason I ask you that is because whenever I'm, whenever I come came across your notion of the four dimensional tesser, tesseract brain, it almost seemed to me like your your theory of this of this this brain that exists, like Charlie said, um, in a sort of atemporal state almost or eternal state perhaps that it's uh, temporally extended as opposed to the notion of the self or the ego that's within time you know, that experiences dynamics, changes, flux, so forth. It really seems to mirror the Kantian notion of the, uh, the empirical ego and the transcendental subject, because it, it seems like your book is almost like a proof and a reworking of this theory, um, that Kant's, what he called the transcendental subject, uh, which is the a priori, he calls it the transcendental a priori sort of, uh, synthesizing unit that would grant apprehension uh, to all of consciousness. That seems to be the sort of like spatio-temporally embedded tesseract brain that you're speaking of. Uh, whereas, of course, the empirical ego, which is this person I'm talking to right now, the person who's speaking. So I like I, I basically wanted to ask you, how do you think it is that these dynamics, these temporal dynamics seem so incredibly real to the human being? Why Why doesn't it seem like it's uh, some eternal phenomenon? Well, there are all kinds of reasons why we couldn't go through life dealing with information from other times in our timeline. I mean, as an organism, we need to respond to what's happening now, not what's, you know, what's happening in the past or what's happening in the future, and especially not 
at all times. I mean, that would, how would that be useful? You know, the, the, mo the, the, the body needs to respond to what is happening now. And the, you know, the brain, you know, reductively is the control system of the body. So and this is something I, I, yeah, I get into in the new book, um, it, it, sort of the idea that, uh, you know, Aldous Huxley talked about the brain as a reducing valve for consciousness. And he was thinking sort of this spatially expanded consciousness, right? Well, I think that the brain is, in a sense, it is kind of a reducing valve, but it's reducing our long self to to a to a very narrow cursor of that that long you know video ribbon uh, of of our life you know it's reducing it to what is needed in the moment but it's not perfect you know it's not perfect the the now you know any psychologist will can tell you or cognitive psychologist will tell you that what we think of as the now is not an instant you know it's kind of a variable narrow swath of time but but it's you know maybe three seconds or something like that and i would say that the different states of consciousness kind of can widen it more or can and, and potentially certain mental illnesses or or pathological states might you know open it you know to a degree that that the the organism becomes dysfunctional unable to function because it's receiving you know information that it doesn't that's not pertinent um to the present instant of survival you know in the in the world so i think there are a lot of reasons why it's not really good or healthy to to be conscious of that long self you know, this is why it's part of our unconscious, you know, um, and it's bringing us information that that does guide us subtly. You know, I think that what we call intuition is really just a manifestation of this precognitive unconscious that's that's sensitive to rewards and and punishments uh, ahead in our timeline and steering us sort of just past calamities often. Uh, now, some can't, calamities can't be averted, you know, no matter how intuitive you are. But, uh, you know, bad things happen to, to good precogs, as I say in the, in the new book. But I, I think there is, there's a general tendency, and this isn't just in humans. I mean, I think, I, I think this is going to turn out to be a, uh, a general tendency in, in life, uh, that, that there's this kind of precognitive dimension, you know, precognitive that implies having a brain. I and mean, I think that even single celled organisms probably, you know, are orienting in some subtle way, they're orienting towards their own survival in, you know, 200 milliseconds or two seconds or whatever, you know, and that that, that could well prove to be, a, I like to speculate that this could prove to be important in figuring out the, the, the sort of missing X factor that, that, separates life from lifeless physical processes could be this this ability of living some systems to capitalize on those those quantum computing properties that that do exist in certain molecular uh, arrangements such as prince you know something like microtubules maybe um you know these are just just molecules just just a certain molecular arrangement of of atoms but that has seems to have a uh, uh, a, a quantum computing kind of property um, because of its arrangement. You know, if, if living systems have evolved to sort of capitalize on these, on these, the ability of, of uh, molecular quantum computers to, to orient towards their own future survival, well, then there you have potentially an important uh, principle of living systems. I mean, that's speculation. I mean, I'm, I'm not a, you know, I, I like to, my work is kind of, futurist in, in a way i'm kind of like prophesying what i think is going to be discovered you know in, in 10 or 20 years but i'm not you know i'm not a biologist so i'm not i'm not able to uh to do the research that would prove it but i'm but i'm bringing together a lot of different strands of existing science that seem to point in a certain direction sure yeah and uh one of the uh one of the interviews you did previously on the hermetics podcast where i first heard you uh james ellis who interviewed you asked you the question essentially like what it would be like to be a quantum computer you know how is it that uh 
you know, what would it be like to be under a completely different order of time? But I, I think what you're kind of getting at right now is that uh, it wouldn't be anything unlike what we're experiencing right now. It seems like your model, I mean, does you, does your model of how the human brain takes in this pre this retrocausal information, uh, precognitive information, does it sort of uh, work off of the orc or theory uh, that, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Stuart Hameroff and uh, Roger Penrose have been championing for a while? No, I don't. I don't. I don't hold to that theory. I, I'm. I'm not. I'm not that much of a fan of Penrose's contribution to, to their 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 partnership. I mean, I I, I think Stuart Hameroff, his discoveries are crucial, but I just I think that there's the significance of those discoveries is going to lie elsewhere than in this search for consciousness, and I, I don't find the or, or theory very compelling. Sure, sure. Charlie, you said you had a question about uh, his new book. I'm going to ask that. Yeah. So Eric Wargo's new book, uh, Precognitive Dreamwork and the Long Self, Interpreting Messages from Your Future. Um, I kind of read the snippet on Amazon to get an idea of what it is looking at. So my question is, to use myself as an example, I've had two very distinct moments in my life where I was doing something seemingly inconsequential. And I specifically remembered dreaming that exact occurrence. Uh, it wasn't deja vu. I remembered the dream how old I was. Uh, so that is something that has always, I, I'm, it's just confusing. I don't know what the purpose of it is. How can we, aside from keeping a dream journal, look into, um, working with this idea of working with this, this, uh, occurrence without spoiling too much of your, uh, book coming out next month, of course. <laughs> I'm happy to spoil it. It's like for anyone who wants the answer to that question, this, this book, goes into detail uh uh the the basic steps of of precognitive dream work are just three essentially uh then the first first one you already mentioned keep a dream journal now a lot of people do that all right but the problem is they're not attuned to this idea of the possibility of precognition because most people haven't even heard of it you know uh and so uh, the, the second step is really what defines precognitive dream work. And that is you keep a dream journal, but then at the end of every day before bed, go back to your dream journal and look at the dream or dreams you had that morning and also the dreams you had the previous few days, couple days, and just reflect on them first. Just reflect on them and reflect on the events, things that happened during that time span. That step, which no one thinks to do, right? I mean, who thinks to do that? That you will start to see cases of pre instances that that hint at precognition, like, and and often they're not obvious. They're not like things that that scream, oh, this was precognitive, but there will be some element of the dream that is just kind of uncannily similar to something that happened uh, in waking life over those two or three days. Most, most precognitive dreams are gonna be noticed within about three days of the dream, but that's, but that's it's partly an effect of, of the fact that no one has time to look over their whole dream diary every night <laughs> for for every every day of their life you know you, that's you you have to kind of set limits so uh there there does seem to be a, a though a a principle that that dreams tend to relate to events that are immediately upcoming if not the following day then the next couple of days but there's a third now that okay i'll say those first two steps were already laid out by sort of the pioneer theorist of precognitive dream uh, dreaming, uh, which was J.W. Dunn. He was a uh, aeronautical engineer uh, in the early years of the last century uh, in England. Uh, and he noticed that he was having dreams about often about things that he would read in the paper the next couple of days. Uh, and so he 
sort of formulated these principles. And he wrote this amazing book called An Experiment with Time, uh, which gave multiple examples of his own precognitive dreams and those of, of people that he knew and sort of theorized, created a theory uh, about how consciousness comes unstuck in time at night and so forth. And it's a, it was a fascinating book and very influential on, on a lot of writers. In fact, uh, in the middle years of the century, it was, it was incredibly influential on, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, for instance, people don't know that, but that he was the timeless sort of eternalist view of his elven races, uh, was actually based on J.W. Dunn. Uh, a lot of writers uh, in, the, in the new book, I talk about uh, some of Vladimir Nabokov's experiences with precognitive dreaming and precognitive dream work. Anyway, so those are the, the two principles that J.W. Dunn identified and wrote about. Now, what I'm, where I'm going beyond J.W. Dunn in, in a pretty major way is that uh, Dunn wasn't really interested in dream symbolism. He wasn't interested in kind of dreams that were non-literal. The bulk of dreams and the bulk of precognitive dreams are not going to be apparent if you're not accustomed to sort of a Freudian or psychoanalytic or even Jungian approach to dreams and not attuned to the way your brain symbolizes things. So the third step, uh, and it's really not a step, it's very it's very easy, again, if they are, if you're not sort of steeped in a psychoanalytic tradition of some sort, you're not going to think to do it, which is simply free associating. Free associating just means, what's the first thing that this dream element reminds me of? Okay. And do that for every dream. And when you, when you write it down, write down your associations to the dream and your associations aren't, you know, you're not, if it's a precognitive dream, you're not going to yet know what it's precognitive of, but those associations are often what contain the link to the, to an event that happens the next day or the next week or whatever. It's those free associations. So, so free associating on your dream, when you write it down, you will, I guarantee, <laughs> you know, you will start uh, recording lots of instances of dream precognition that are really uncanny, but that that's that little bit of free association that is often the, the, the missing piece. Uh, and that's why I think in this, this was a big argument in time loops too. We need to bring Freud back in a big way. I mean, there's this preconception that Freud has been debunked, uh, or that his, you know, ideas were retrograde and, and completely baseless. I mean, that's, even in psycho even in cognitive psychology, they have started to kind of acknowledge that actually Freud was really a pioneer. I mean, in 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 studying what he called the unconscious, what is now often called implicit implicit processes or whatever. They don't often like to use the word unconscious, but he was he really really discovered a lot. Uh, people reduce him to the sex stuff, and that's and that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, you can, yeah, you can kind of jettison that kind of sexual dimension of Freud, but the 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 basic insights about the unconscious and the way the the ways that that ideas are symbolized in dreams, uh, or in symptoms, or in slips of the tongue, or in art, in creativity, all these things I believe are actually manifestations of precognition. So I'm sort of trying to flip Freud and show that, you know, people think of the of the unconscious as the buried part of the iceberg. You know, there's the, the consciousness up here at the top and then everything under the water is the unconscious. I like to flip that on its that image on its side and say that 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 unconscious is our future. You know, it's, it's what's what's going to happen in our future that we don't we don't know yet. We haven't experienced it yet. We haven't been to the future yet physically, but uh, it is impacting us in all kinds of ways, all the same ways that Freud identified uh, as, as manifestations of the unconscious. So like, you know, his, his great classic books from the turn of the century, you know, interpretation of dreams. Okay. Dream work is the number one way that you can get in touch with this. But uh, his second book was the parapsych, uh, no, I'm sorry, not the, the, the psychopathology of everyday life. Okay. So things like slips of the tongue, you know, bizarre thoughts that, that, you know, synchronous, what, what, Carl Jung would later call synchronicities. These kinds of things are manifestations of the precognitive unconscious. And then art is a huge one. Um, the uh, book that I'm slowly working on right now is about 
creativity as a precognitive phenomenon. So, but but dreams are the easiest way. If you want to discover your precognition, just do pre, pre just do dream work. And my book talks about those those steps, but then then uh, talks a lot about various principles, interpretive principles that you can apply, and and some of the ba- the. The, the, the principles that seem to govern precognition and how information is transformed as it reaches us from the future. And it turns out that the laws governing a self-consistent universe uh, in, a, in, a, in a universe that has wormholes, it turns out those laws map directly onto, onto the Freudian principles of, of symbolic transformation. So it's kind of like it, it's kind of like merging Einstein and Freud <laughs> in, in, in a way to talk about the principles uh, that govern the distortion of information in dreams. Part of what part of the the incentive for writing the new book was that uh, time loops is really dense, you know, and people were kind of getting bogged down in the physics stuff in part two, and and I I thought yeah, and and I was getting so many responses from people telling me their dreams and and asking about dreams, which is something I, I, I do talk about dreams in time loops, but it not, it's not the main topic. And I realized, well, what is needed is a, a much more kind of simplified book that just focuses in on that 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 element of dreaming, which is is, you know, we all dream. Uh, this is a way to get in touch with this very immediately in your life and uh, and have some pretty mind blowing experiences pretty quickly uh you know people you know a lot of people like you i mean you have you've you've got a, a few precognitive dreams in your life that wow what was that what did that mean well y- if you follow the steps in this book you can start having that experience on a weekly basis you know or more or more uh, it really becomes uh, very prevalent and and what's amazing is that 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 precognition really can span decades in your life Particularly if you if you've had if you've kept a dream diary for a long time, you will start to find a, just mind blowing instances of uh, of a powerful experience in your life that impacted you decades ago. You know, um, uh, and and you can see it right in your dream journal. It's 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 quite amazing. And that's where the long self comes in, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, uh, to bounce off what Charlie was saying a little bit too, this definitely does. I mean, it, like you said, people get bogged down with time loops. I mean, time loops is a hard book. It's absolutely fascinating, but it is hard. But I think once you actually start to look at your own dreams and kind of, you know, do this, uh, do a little bit of dream work. I mean, it, it becomes so much more like palpable. It's, it's, it's really like, like a paradigm shift for your own thinking. It, it ceases to become abstract or it ceases to be abstract. It's, um, it can be really moving. Yeah. That was my experience. And then, yeah, this goes back to your first question. How do I get interested in this? Well, I mean, I, I, as I'm reading about this topic and reading JW Dunn's work and reading a few modern writers who've talked a bit about premonitions and dreams and stuff like that, I realized that, oh, well, this had happened to me, you know, and, you know, for instance, I had a dream on the morning of 9-11 that related not not in a direct and immediately obvious way to the events of that morning. Um, I, I didn't dream about planes literally hitting buildings, but I dreamed about like a pair of buildings that had a corrugated facade like the like like those buildings. And it was in a context that because of free association, I immediately associated with suicide and crisis and it, it had direct associations to all the themes of that day and my and of my emotions during that day uh and that's why when you when you bring these interpretive these kind of freudian interpretive tools to bear on your dreams you will start to see how precognition is is manifesting constantly uh, I think it's a basic function of dreams. In fact, I, I sort of go out on a limb in the book. I know people are going to jump all over me for, for this, but I go on a limb and say that there's no reason not to assume that all of our dreams are, pre, are precognitive. I mean, why why would nature create a, a, create a process like dreaming uh, that only let us be precognitive occasionally? You know, that's it's that kind of thinking that it, it, there's a kind of apologetic sort of thinking that that 
goes with any paranormal phenomenon. There's this kind of impulse to make it, well, just as rare as we can make it, because somehow that'll make it more palpable to the skeptics. You know, if we can just say, well, precognition is, you know, it's just something that's very rare, somehow that'll be less offensive to, you know, the mainstream critics of these ideas. But that's, that's ridiculous. You're not, you're not advancing the field if you have that apologetic <laughs> mindset, and it's not realistic. You know, if precognition exists at all, it's going to be a nightly occurrence, and it's going to be constant. It's, it's going to be basic to our cognition. You know, it's not going to be just some little add-on. And I think that's what I'm that really trying to get across in the book. And I'm also trying to recruit readers to become citizen scientists on this, uh, because what's needed is a kind of a critical mass of people who are changing conversation about dreams based on their own palpable, demonstrable experiences that they can show to a skeptic or show to a, a sleep scientist or whatever and say, look, you know, this is real. You know, you can't continue to deny this. And eventually I'm hoping that'll lead to the kind of scientific you know, large scale scientific research that'll legitimize this topic because there's just a huge truth gap you know, of all the, I've dealt, you know, I've spent the last 10 years sort of meandering in various, not meandering, but I've, I've, I've dipped my toe into a lot of different paranormal neighborhoods, you know, and of all of them, I think precognition and precognitive dreams is the most ripe for just a complete overturning of mainstream thinking because it's so prevalent and it's, and all of the arguments of the skeptics you know, that it's law of large numbers and stuff like that. All of these arguments go out the window when when you really see the prevalence of, of this phenomenon. And it's something that people can demonstrate for themselves very easily. Yeah, it's probably one of the, if not the coolest uh, way to kind of rally public, uh, like public participation in science I think I've ever heard. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's simple to do and it's absolutely fascinating. Critics will call you know, public participation in pseudoscientists. You know, pseudoscientists is what they're going to call it. What what you know, critics of my book will. I'm sure I'll get Amazon. You know, one star Amazon reviews. <laughs> yeah, well, they're gonna they're gonna be skeptics all they want. Um, There's, yeah, you, yeah. There's skeptics gonna skept. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, I have a daughter, um, and I've noticed that she she seems very precognitive. Does is there something, I mean, like uncannily so, yeah. um, yeah, it's, it's creepy almost <laughs> like, like, how do you know that? Well, this has been noticed though, uh, you know, people who parapsychologists have noticed that, that children are particularly sensitive to whatever, whatever name the psych, psychic phenomenon or, you know, seeing ghosts or whatever children are uniquely sensitive. And yeah, I mean, it's been argued that it's, simply, you know, giving voice to those precognitive visions or dreams or whatever is socialized out of us, you know, by our, you know, in our upbringing, we're sort of socialized not to do that. Uh, that may be part of it. But yeah, children, children are very, very precognitive. And it, and it tends to get one of the another of the big arguments I make both in time loops and the new book is that precognition is almost always misinterpreted as something else. It's always construed in some other way, uh, some easier to think, easier to comprehend way, you know, so a precognitive experience will often naturally be understood as a telepathic experience or clairvoyant experience or, or, or whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it, no one thinks about precognition. In fact, the, one of the metaphors I use in the book is the is the the Monty Python skit, you know, Spanish Inquisition. You know, no one expects a Spanish Inquisition. Well, no one expects precognition. You know, the, we 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 will always naturally, as human beings, uh, we will interpret you know interpret these things as something else. Synchronicity being the big one. I mean, the, Carl Jung provided a kind of handy term for coinc meaningful coincidences. And he sort of attributed it to the collective unconscious and the working of archetypes and so forth. But almost invariably in what so-called synchronistic experiences, um, it's demonstrably precognition operative. You know, we are oriented, we are unconsciously oriented towards rewards in our future. 
right? In, and including meaningful convergences of one sort or another. And then when these things happen, we don't realize that we were the ones orchestrating them, you know, unconsciously. But to get back to your observation about your daughter, yeah, my daughter too. Um, uh, you know, just amazing, um, you know, bizarre, uncanny. <laughs> You know, in the past year, she started telling me her dreams sometimes. And I, I'm, like, very careful not to, like, impose my, you know, it's like, oh, we, you know, I'm I'm just, I just listen curiously. And she'll have these dreams, which then come true that day, you know. Yes, that's that's happened a number of times. It's it's the oddest thing. There is there is so much that we did not cover that I really wanted to get to. Eric, is there any, do you have any final words? It's a pleasure, and it and it was really a pleasure talking about Alien. Actually, <laughs> uh, there's just so much that can be said about about that film and um, and about H.R. Giger, and so that was uh, that was a, a pleasure. But yeah, it was, this is I'm 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 glad to turn you on to precognitive dream work, and uh, hope that you have fun with the book, get results, and let me know the results you get. <laughs> Sounds good. We'll do. Thanks. We really, uh, really appreciate it, Eric. It was great meeting you.